It's my birthday today and I want to talk about movies, so that's what I'm going to do. Hello everybody, I'm Dan Merle, and as you probably took from that tag and from the title of this video, today is my birthday, and it's not just any birthday, it's my 40th birthday, and so I decided to spend the day talking about 40 of my favorite movies. Well, that's not exactly true. You're watching this on a day where I'm telling you about my 40 favorite movies, I'm probably spending today proper sitting in a room alone thinking about my own mortality. Actually, I thought this would be kind of fun because it's similar to the AFI's 100 Years, 100 Movies, and I thought for a while about like, well, what if I pick the best movie for every year that I've been alive? But the more I thought about it, the more I figured it was so hard to do, and how do you even quantify best? So I decided to pivot a little bit. For each year, from 1983 to 2022, the 40 years that I've been alive, I decided to pick the movie that had the biggest impact on me, the one that was the biggest part of my movie-going life. If you were going to look at my film DNA, these would be the little building blocks of that DNA. And it basically gives me an opportunity to share how I got where I am year by year. Some of these movies I saw in the years they, they were released, some of these movies I saw many years after they were released, but I just thought it'd be kind of fun, sort of a my history book of movies. So let's start in the year that I was born, which was 1983, and the movie that I picked that had the biggest impact on me that year, no surprise, is Return of the Jedi. Although I will say I experienced this movie and people of my generation experienced it a lot different from the people that are in generations after ours. Because for us, this movie for many years was the end. They defeated the Empire, Darth Vader was dead, the Emperor was gone, and everybody lived happily ever after. And so Return of the Jedi actually has a different impact on a certain generation of people than on any other generation of people. But it's a movie that I revisited so many times, and that original Star Wars trilogy was such a huge landmark story for people my age that even when you add it on to it with prequels and sequels, that impact isn't diminished. You failed, Your Highness. I am a Jedi, like my father before me. The movie I picked for 1984 is Ghostbusters because it was one of the first cross-platform things that I enjoyed. Yes, I liked the movie, but I also watched the cartoon show, I had the toys, it was sort of my introduction to merchandising, and it was also a movie that I enjoyed as a kid because of the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, huh? that's very funny. something you don't see every day. But I actually matured with it, and as I got older, I began to understand some of the jokes even more and appreciate the movie on an even deeper level. Everything was fine with our system until the power grid was shut off by dickless here. Is this true? Yes, it's true. This man has no dick. So this is a movie that was something that played nonstop in the VCR when I was growing up, but that has also become one of my favorite movies as an adult because it actually plays on those different levels. Ray, when someone asks you if you're a god, you say yes! My pick for 1985 probably isn't a surprise either. It's Back to the Future, which I think is a distillation of great movie storytelling and all of the elements that need to come together just right to make a great movie. You have wonderful casting, some great lead characters that are perfectly cast with Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd. I'm, I'm sorry, Eric Stoltz, but it just wouldn't have been the same. And even going down to Crispin Glover and Thomas F. Wilson and Leah Thompson, what a great cast in this movie. So why don't you make like a tree and get out of here? And then beyond just the script and the jokes and everything else, the score from Alan Silvestri, one of my favorite movie scores of all time, and just a great classically told story. Easy stakes to understand even when you're young, because I probably saw this movie when I was five or six years old for the first time, and another movie that you can enjoy when you're a kid, but you can also enjoy when you're an adult. Next Saturday night, we're sending you back to the future. The movie I picked for 1986 is John Hughes's Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which I actually experienced in an alternate version than everyone else because I was only allowed to watch the TV version from NBC when I was growing up. So there was all kinds of swearing and stuff that I discovered later. But the reason I picked this movie is because it was one of the first ones to kind of challenge my concept of what a story was like, even when I was a kid, because this character was different from other characters. He talked to the camera, there were graphics on screen. I began to understand that 
there are different ways to tell a story and that there are different kinds of characters. And I began to kind of understand in a weird way what screenwriting is and how storytelling technique can fit the specific kind of movie. But apart from that, I also just think it's a really, really funny movie. It kind of encapsulates the 80s in many ways, but it's a great coming of age film. And it also helped me to understand things like editing and music and the intention of a scene, the museum scene, for example. I didn't understand when I was a kid. I thought it was boring. But as I grew older and understood these characters more, I could see what the intention of that scene was and why it was so vitally important to the film. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. The movie I picked from 1987 is actually one that I saw long after 1987, and that's RoboCop. I've said that I was late to this movie because I couldn't watch a lot of R-rated movies when I was a kid, even though they were marketing the toys and stuff when I was growing up. In the fight for justice, nothing can stop. RoboCop. RoboCop and the Ultra Police, each sold separately with RoboCaps. And this movie really is evidence that great stories know no genre and no boundaries because this looks like it could be the dumbest movie ever and in some wonderful ways it is. But I also think that it's a pretty much perfectly told story inside of a razor sharp satire. I've said many times before, I will go to bat for Robocop any day of the week as one of the best stories from a character level of any mainstream Hollywood film. Plus, it really does hold up in almost every aspect. Nice shooting, son. What's your name? Murphy. The movie I picked for 1988 is Who Framed Roger Rabbit for several reasons. First of all, Bob Hoskins is a genius, and he's so good as Eddie Valiant. Do you mean to tell me that you could have taken your hand out of that cuff at any time? No, not at any time. Only when it was funny. <laughs> and Christopher Lloyd as Judge Doom. It didn't even register in my mind that this is the same person as Doc Brown. When I kill you, brother, I talk. Yes! But the other reason I picked this movie, and the reason it has an even deeper meaning for me, is that even though I was five years old, watching this on screen, my mind was blown because all of my favorite cartoon characters were all in the same movie, and I didn't understand how that worked. But I also couldn't quite understand how they did it. And the prevalence of the making of documentaries and stuff on TV, and the groundbreaking technical nature of this film, it was one of the first things that actually got me interested in the craft of filmmaking. How did they make these movies? Not just that they made the movies, but the technical craft behind it. And it was one of my first introductions to all of the tricks of the trade behind the camera. It really sparked a curiosity in me that I still have to this day. I'm not bad. I'm just drawn that way. My pick for 1989, and remember, these are not what I'm saying are the best movies of the year. These are the ones that had the biggest impact on me. Batman 1989 was by far a cultural seismic event in my young life. It was my favorite movie of all time from the instant that I saw it. I was already a Batman fan. It turned me into a Batman fanatic from that point on. I'm still a Batman fanatic. I love Michael Keaton in this movie. I love Jack Nicholson in this movie. Hell, I love Robert Wool in this movie. Check this out. He must have been king of the wicker people. This was a cultural event around the country. It was the idea that you could like these superheroes and you didn't have to be ashamed of it. You didn't have to feel like it was for children. Of course, I was a child and I loved it, but it also lent an air of legitimacy to superheroes that they still enjoy to this day. Batman was such an important movie in the superhero genre, even though people now look at it and kind of laugh at the fact that it is cheesy in 80s, the Prince music, etc. I think that it is still a landmark comic book movie, and it was certainly a landmark movie for me. Then he had us. Now you want to get nuts? Come on, let's get nuts. My pick for 1990 might be surprising to some people because it's also a comics-related film, and that's Dick Tracy. I loved this movie. Warren Beatty directed in it, starred in it. It includes what I would call peak Madonna, but it also was another movie that got me interested in how you make movies because there was so much prosthetic makeup and effects and just grotesque stuff in this film, and I was a couple years older than when I'd seen Who Framed Roger Rabbit. I was even more into, how do they do that? How do they transform that person? Wait, 
that person is that guy from a different movie, but he doesn't look at all like that. Again, it's all about becoming interested in the craft behind the film and the cinematography, the look of it. How did they get this thing to look this way? These bright, bold, primary colors. It was not like any other movie that I'd seen before, and it left a huge impression on me. I will also fight anybody who says that Al Pacino is not good in this movie. I think his performance as Big Boy Caprice is one of the best performances in his career, and I will fight you on that any day. You challenge me, we all go dark. There was one Napoleon, one Washington, one me. For 1991, I picked James Cameron's Terminator 2 Judgment Day. As I sort of mentioned with Robocop, this was a very unique time where even R-rated films were marketed to children. Now create your own Terminator with the Bio Flesh Regenerator. I'm back, yeah? Think again. Battle damage. Add flesh compound. Terminator created. So I had the Terminator 2 toys, I had the Terminator 2 trading cards, I had the Terminator 2 comic books, but I couldn't actually see the movie. I had to wait for it to come on ABC to see it for the first time on network television. I didn't see the R-rated version until probably seven or eight years after the movie first came out. But even on network TV, it's just a mind-blowing movie. And again, going down the rabbit hole from Who Framed Roger Rabbit to Batman to Dick Tracy, and then this movie. Talk about a movie that makes you want to know how movies are made. It's hard to explain what it was like to be growing up in your formative years at a time when the way that movies were made was being radically reformed. It really did, for those of us that were into movies, ignite the spark of interest that has not died out in the decades since. I know now why you cry, but it's something I can never do. On the other side of the spectrum, for 1992, the movie that I'm picking is one called Glen Gary Glen Ross. If you haven't seen it, you probably know it from that Alec Baldwin speech that everybody parodies. Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only. I saw this movie in college and I was floored by it and it introduced me to what I call the, the verbal action movie. It's the same way that Aaron Sorkin writes. It's a movie that is driven entirely by dialogue, but the way that it's written, the way that it's delivered, the way that the movie is directed, it feels like an action film. And to me, this movie zips along so fast. I turned that contract around, that's eight units, 82 grand. And I said, now I want you to sign and it showed me a different kind of filmmaking. And the first time you see a movie of a certain type, A Few Good Men is very similar to this movie, and I think a lot of people probably had the same experience with that movie. You don't forget it. The idea that writing in and of itself can be exciting and can be just as energetic and fascinating as the biggest action scene was a real game changer for me. You know what it takes to sell real estate? It takes brass balls to sell real estate. Speaking of game changers, 1993, what other movie could I pick than Jurassic Park, which was, to that point in my 10-year-old life, the most incredible thing that I'd ever seen on or off of a movie screen. Again, it's hard to explain just how important these movies were to kids at this age when you saw dinosaurs on screen. Like, they made dinosaurs. And the next question out of my mouth was, how did they make those dinosaurs? And reading all the things and the behind the scenes and the books. And of course, Steven Spielberg, I had already seen E.T. I was a big fan of E.T. I think at that point I had already seen Jaws. If I hadn't seen Jaws, I was going to see it pretty soon. Jurassic Park really drew me in to wanting to know who this Steven Spielberg guy was. And he is to this day my favorite director. Plus, Jurassic Park is just a great, tight really well-written, well-executed, great characters. It's damn near a perfect movie. When they opened Disneyland in 1956, mm -hmm. nothing worked. Yeah, nothing. but John, if the Pirates of the Caribbean breaks down, the Pirates don't eat the tourists. My pick for 1994 is Pulp Fiction, which again is a movie at the time that re-scrambled my brain as to how you could tell a story. I remember my mom saw it way before I did, and she came home talking about this weird movie that she'd gone to see where like it opens with a couple talking, and then the whole movie happens, and it comes back to that same couple, and they're still talking about the same thing, and it was such a weird movie, and it didn't connect in my brain until after I'd seen Pulp Fiction that that's the movie that she was talking about. Now we played with narrative and time and shuffling things around so much that it kind of seems like an old trick but Quentin Tarantino really was revolutionary in his at least bringing it to the American sensibility and the American 
independent movement that was going on at the time. Yes, there are a lot of things that have not aged well with this movie, and a lot of them involve Quentin Tarantino himself, but I think that its cultural stamp hasn't really faded, and it gave us so many things, like Samuel L. Jackson, our modern version, our modern love of Samuel L. Jackson, really started with this movie. And you will know my name is the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon thee. There were some years where I couldn't narrow it down to one movie as to which one had the biggest impact, so I had to narrow it down to two, and I picked two films for 1995. The first was GoldenEye, which was Pierce Brosnan's first James Bond film. It was also my first James Bond film, and it kicked off a love for that franchise that continues to this day. Thank you, Mr. The name's Bond. James Bond. The other one is Toy Story, which was the first fully CG animated film, and again was an example of how you can do a familiar thing in a completely new way. I think I saw both of these movies the same day. My uncle and I would always go see movies after Thanksgiving, and I think the two of us went to see GoldenEye. I'd probably seen it two or three times during the day, and then we took the whole family to see Toy Story at night, and I was just blown away by it. Plus the idea of having somebody like Tom Hanks and Tim Allen doing the voices in a cartoon, that was unheard of almost at that point. Robin Williams had done Aladdin, but the idea of this all-star cast that every animated movie has now, a lot of that trail was also blazed by Toy Story. You are a sad, strange little man. And you have my pity. My pick for 1996 is kind of obscure, especially when you consider a lot of the other movies that came out, but it's That Thing You Do, which was the directorial debut of Tom Hanks. I love this movie. There's not a cynical bone in its body. It's a movie that I can put on any time and just smile and enjoy and laugh at. If you haven't seen it, it's about a fictional band in Pennsylvania called The Wonders who have a, a one-hit wonder called That Thing You Do and their rise to fame in the 1960s rock scene. The Wonders. Lenny. Yeah, it looks like the Oneaters. No, the, the Wonders. Got it. Looks like the Oneaters. And it's also something on a personal level, a movie that I bonded with my uncle as well. He was such a key part of my movie going life. And we would reference this movie and talk about this movie all the time. If you haven't seen that thing you do, it's such a great little movie. Oh, I'm not here with these fellas. I got a big in competition over at the Livestock Pavilion, and I am going to win that blue ribbon. My pick for 1997, not really shocking, is James Cameron's Titanic. Another movie that was a total game changer as far as how movies are made. And even at three hours and 15 minutes, and the fact that I was 14 and then 15 years old while it was in theaters, I think I saw it three times in theaters, and it really was just to marvel at the enormity of what James Cameron had accomplished. Nobody, or at least I certainly, had not seen anything that big, like the Titanic and the sinking of it, realized so realistically. But this ship can't sink. She's made of iron, sir. I assure you, she can. And she will. And it wasn't just the effects. I love Kate Winslet in this movie. I love Leo DiCaprio in this movie. And Billy Zane's performance is the perfect so bad it's good turn in just about any movie. You know, there's nothing I couldn't give you. There's nothing I'd deny you. If you would not deny me. Tom Hanks was big in the 1990s, and he was big for me because my pick for 1998 is Saving Private Ryan, one of the rare R-rated films that I got the go-ahead from my mom to go see in the theater. She went to the ticket counter and like signed a permission slip to let me go in and see it. And I think it's because she felt like it was probably instructive for me to start understanding the brutalities of the past. This was certainly the most visceral movie I had seen to that point, but it's not just the gruesome battles and the opening scene. It is about the characters and about these impossible choices that you find yourself faced with when you're at war. Finding him so he can go home. If that earns me the right to get back to my wife, well then then that's my mission. I'd also like to mention that Saving Private Ryan losing Best Picture to Shakespeare in Love is definitely my supervillain origin story. Shakespeare in Love. <laughs> David Cartman, Donna Gelati. 1999 was such a landmark year. I could have picked any number of movies, Fight Club or The Matrix or The Sixth Sense, but I ended up going with Being John Malkovich because it's another one that rewired my brain. I didn't think that you could make movies this weird, that you could make a movie about a door that goes inside the brain of actor John Malkovich, and the fact that John Malkovich is in it. You see the world through John Malkovich's eyes, and then after about 15 minutes, you're spit out. 
into a ditch on the side of the New Jersey Turnpike. When you look at the class of 99, as it were, I think that Being John Malkovich is a pretty underrated movie. And I think it also helped to inspire this sort of absurdist movement that so many other films would successfully use in the years after. I will see you in court. Hey, Malkovich, think fast. <laughs> Ooh, when you want to talk about a movie with impact, my pick for 2000 is Requiem for a Dream. First of all, the fact that Ellen Burstyn didn't win the Academy Award for her performance in this movie is literally criminal. Somebody should be criminally charged for that. We're giving the prizes away. I just wanted to be on the show. <laughs> I saw it my freshman year. I couldn't stop thinking about it. I, I still can't stop thinking about it. I probably only revisited it, to be honest two or three times in the last 20 plus years because that's really all you need to see. But in addition to the power of its story and the characters and all this weird messed up stuff that happens in the movie, as a burgeoning editor, and it was at this time in 2000, 2001 that I was really kind of starting to turn my eye towards editing, I was really fascinated by this movie and was kind of trying to take it apart like, you know, like a watch, like you try to figure that out. And it was a huge look for me at the new methods and styles that were being employed in filmmaking. Let's give a juicy welcome to Mrs. Sarah Goldfarb. Juice by Sarah, juice by Sarah, juice by Sarah. Oh, Sarah juice. My pick for 2001 is The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. I knew absolutely nothing about J.A.R. Tolkien before these movies were coming out. I saw the first trailer for the movie and I was like, well, yeah, that looks kind of interesting. I'll go buy this first book and if I don't like it, then I won't finish it. And I would sit, I remember in my dorm room and, and in the common room, I would read a chapter of the book and then I'd go back and I'd watch the trailer and I'd spot the things that I just read and then I'd read another chapter. It really inducted me into this world of Tolkien and I love the Lord of the Rings books to this day. It's my favorite Middle Earth film and I also have to say, you know, when you talk about a time and a place, it, it, it's kind of a bummer, but 2001, a couple of months after 9-11, that speech that Gandalf gives Frodo when he talks about the times that were given and choosing the time that's given to you, that was really profoundly meaningful to me at that time because everybody was sort of reeling about what had just happened a few months before. I was at college away from home for the first time, and it sounds weird to say that I took comfort from the words of the wizard in the Hobbit movie, but I kind of did. I wish none of this had happened. So do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. 2002 is a little bit of a lighter weight year, and I was trying to figure out what movie to pick. And this is definitely another example of one that I'm not exactly saying is the best movie, but had the biggest impact on me. And that is Signs. Signs scared the bejesus out of me, mostly because I had to come home to an empty house. I was home from college, and I think I slept with every light on. I, I don't, well, I do kind of scare easily, but not that easily. And I still get creeped out when I think about stuff from Signs. M. Night Shyamalan, sure, he's had a spotty track record, and I get that the ending of this film, the execution could definitely have used some work. But this movie is really, really effective, and to prove that, I really only have to say two words to you. Birthday party. Before we move on with today's show, I want to thank one of our sponsors, Athletic Greens, the makers of AG1. I started taking it because I'm looking to support better gut health and overall better me. And during this cold and flu season, anything you can do to boost your body's immune system is a plus. So what is this stuff? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and more to help you start your day right. Taking AG1 is super simple. I can either put a scoop right into a cup of water or mix it into a shake. Either way, it's a quick and tasty way for me to start my day off right and make sure that I'm supporting not only my gut health, but my immune system, my recovery, focus, and so much more. AG1 is lifestyle friendly and contains less than one gram of sugar with no GMOs or artificial anything. And Athletic Greens also cares about the world. They donate to organizations helping to get nutritious food to kids in need, including No Kid Hungry, right here in the US. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash Dan. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash Dan to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance.
I'm sure they have surveillance cameras and they're gonna check them. I, I didn't do anything wrong, Chuck. I really wish you'd stop saying that. Maybe after this video, I'll retire talking about this next movie because I'm sure people are sick of hearing me mention 2003's Shattered Glass, but I still love this movie. I just revisited it, I think, less than a year ago. It's the one that I always show to people or tell people to watch when they say that Hayden Christensen can't act, and it's another one that's just a procedural. It's a journalism procedural. That may be really boring for some people, but I am utterly fascinated by this film every time that I watch it. It's about a reporter named Stephen Glass who's been making stuff up and he gets caught in a lie and the whole movie is just him doubling down doubling down trying to get out of it and this vice is just tightening and tightening and tightening this whole thing is just a pressure cooker peter sarsgaard is incredible in this movie every competitor we ever took a shot at they're gonna pounce and they should because we blew it he handed us fiction after fiction and we printed them all as fact it's indefensible as a birthday present to me, if you haven't seen Shattered Glass, seek it out and find it, because it is one of my very favorite movies. I'm afraid that I'm, I'm gonna do something, okay? Do you hear what I said? Yeah. It's a hell of a story. 2004 is another year where I couldn't just pick one movie, so I had to pick two. My first one is Shaun of the Dead, which I think is my favorite comedy of all time. There was a point when I was in college where we would literally watch this movie nightly. If you were ever to ask me, well, what's the movie that defines your kind of humor, Dan? It would be Shaun of the Dead, and I still love watching this movie, and I still love tracking Edgar Wright's career almost 20 years later. Just get any blunt objects together, all right? If you get cornered, bash him in the head. That seems to work out. The other movie I picked for this year is Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which is directed so imaginatively by Michelle Gondry. Jim Carrey is so good. Kate Winslet is so good. And just the visualization of this, the idea that even that scene in a bookstore where they're having a conversation, the titles are disappearing off the spot. This is such a deep, rich movie, both visually and intellectually, and it's one of my favorite movie endings of all time. Some people say it's bleak, or some people say it's unrealistic. I think it's one of the most realistic and kind of romantic, despite the implications, of any movie I've ever seen. And I'll get bored with you and feel trapped, because that's what happens with me. Okay. 2005 was another one that was a little bit tough, so the movie that I chose was Brokeback Mountain, which is another film that's kind of hard to get a real grasp of outside of its time. It was really derided at the time as the gay cowboy movie, and it also sort of was the movie that started to build the legend of Heath Ledger. I know he'd been in A Knight's Tale and other stuff, but I just mean as one of the generation's best actors, Jake Gyllenhaal, also great in this movie. We could have had a good life together, a real good life. Had us a place of our own. But you didn't want it, Ennis. So what we got now is Brokeback Mountain. There's a very complicated legacy around this film because I think it's a very beautiful film, but it's also one that a lot of people in society just weren't ready for. And I think that's what contributed to the fact that it lost the Best Picture Oscar to Crash, another shocking Oscar moment that I'll never forget. Crash. <laughs> What it really comes down to is the relationship between these two characters, and it's such a deep and painful and heartfelt and heart-rending relationship. It's something that I think back on a lot because these two characters are so well-drawn and well-acted. Man, that's more words than you spoke in the past two weeks. Hell, that's the most I've spoken in a year. All right, get your knives out because the movie I picked for 2006 is The Departed. Yeah, I don't care what you think. I love this movie. It's one of those movies if I'm watching TV or flipping through the channels, which I don't do anymore. Nobody does anymore. But back when I did, if I landed on The Departed, I would sit and watch the rest of it. I love Jack Nicholson in this movie. I love Matt Damon in this movie. I love Leo DiCaprio in this movie. I love Mark Wahlberg in this movie. Who the f*** are you? I'm the guy who does his job. You must be the other guy. You want to say it's minus Scorsese? You want to say he didn't deserve the Academy Award for Best Director for this film or didn't deserve Best Picture? That's fine. It's a brilliant screenplay from William Monaghan, and it's great direction from Martin Scorsese. I love this movie, and I know I'm going to be watching it many, many more times before it's my time to join The Departed. Yeah. You called this number on a dead guy's phone. Who are you? My pick for 2007 is There Will Be Blood. As I recall, I think I saw this movie on the day of the Oscars because I was like, well, this one's nominated for a bunch and they're doing these SNL skits about this character, so I should probably go see what it's all about. I drink your milkshake. 
right? Drink it up! And it has become one of my favorite movies of all time. I mean, we're talking top 10 of all time material. Daniel Day-Lewis, one of the best movie performances of all time. Daniel Plainview is hilarious. He's terrifying. He's a sociopath. He's sympathetic. He's ruthless. He's cunning. He's vulnerable. He's imposing. One night, I'm going to come to you inside of your house, wherever you're sleeping, and I'm going to cut your throat. And I just find this movie hypnotic. It's like two hours and 45 minutes long, I think. Every time I watch it, it feels like it's 25 minutes. It's a breeze. I love this movie. Can I build around 50 miles of Tehachapi Mountains? Don't be thick in front of me, Al. Well, we were talking about Heath Ledger when we go to 2008, again, the biggest impact on me going all the way back to Batman in 1989, we go all the way forward to The Dark Knight in 2008. I liked Batman Begins, but I wasn't quite sure what this movie was going to be. Of course, there was a lot of skepticism around Heath Ledger's casting and then the tragedy of losing him before this movie came out. I remember seeing this at midnight, the night that it came out, and walking out kind of shell-shocked because it was the Batman movie that I had always wanted to see. It was like my nearly 30 years of fandom had all been culminating in that moment. And, and the Joker scenes, I mean, you want to talk about an audience being transfixed. I took your little plan and I turned it on itself. Look what I did to this city with a few drums of gas and a couple of bullets. There was such a buzz about this movie and a feel that this is really something special. There's some elements that maybe haven't aged quite as well, but I think that most of it really holds up. And again, if we're talking about impact, that was the movie of 2008 for me. Some men aren't looking for anything logical. They can't be bought, bullied, reasoned, or negotiated with. Some men just want to watch the world burn. Going now to 2009, and the movie I'm picking is Inglorious Bastards, which I'm pretty sure is my favorite Quentin Tarantino movie. I had never heard of Christoph Waltz before this movie came out, and from the opening scene, which is one of the great opening scenes of all time. You're sheltering enemies of the state, are you not? He's absolutely transfixing. Every time he would switch to a new language, my jaw just dropped. And I also didn't know that this was like an alternate history movie. And that's another thing that most people didn't when it came out. Nobody really knew that they were going to end this movie by machine gunning Hitler and burning all the Nazis alive. And yet here they were. It was such an outlandish idea and it worked. It's another really long movie that feels like it goes by in half an hour when I'm watching it. And I, I love the dialogue. I love the performances. I love that there are these little segments and these little pieces. There's scenes that I look forward to every single time. It's a Wonderfully fun, goofy, crazy, dark movie, and I look forward to seeing it every time I pop it in the Blu-ray player. Ooh, that's a bingo! <laughs> is that the way you say it? That's a bingo. Another movie much derided at the time for 2010 is my pick for that year, which is The Social Network, because when people heard that they were making a Facebook movie, and this was like two or three years after Facebook came out, everybody thought it was a joke. What is this, a parody? And then it turned out to be what I think in many ways for a while was the defining movie of the time. And I think now is almost like the origin story of our times because there's so much that was seeded in this movie that nobody knew would come to fruition later. The concept of the CEO who's kind of trolling his way to the top, the idea of all of this power being concentrated in the hands of people who never expected to have it. It's a movie like Network that was brilliant in its time, but has gained more and more importance and relevance over time. A million dollars isn't cool. You know what's cool? You? A billion dollars. And with all that aside, the style behind it, with David Fincher and the music from Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, the acting is fantastic. It's the first time I ever remember seeing Andrew Garfield in anything. Because I'm not coming back for 30%. I'm coming back for everything. Aaron Sorkin's script is incredible, and I love The Social Network. I really, really do. The rest of my attention is back at the offices of Facebook, where my colleagues and I are doing things that no one in this room, including and especially your clients, are intellectually or creatively capable of doing. These next few years were a little tougher for me. I don't think that they were the strongest movie years. The movie that I picked for 2011 is The Raid Redemption. Rarely is there a movie where I keep hearing, oh, you gotta see it, you gotta see it, you gotta see it, where it lives up to the hype. 
The Raid Redemption lives up to the hype. I think I even like the sequel, The Raid 2, more. It's just there were other movies that year that I didn't mention. So this is almost like a co-raid win here. But this is also the first time I had really seen where action filmmaking was going. If you look at the last decade in action filmmaking, John Wick and a lot of these other movies, it really has its roots in movies like The Raid. And then a lot of that style was brought over to Hollywood. If you haven't seen The Raid Redemption, it is a really great action film and you will see a lot of what you now see in almost every action movie in this one my pick for 2012 again not the best movie of the year but one of my most unforgettable theatrical moments and that is marvel's the avengers we can just call it the avengers at this point i think it has been surpassed by a lot of films inside and outside of the mcu since but again we talk about scale and the idea of seeing something that you have never seen before, it was kind of unheard of at that time that Marvel would ever even be able to pull this off, that you're going to bring together all these superheroes and interconnected movies and then team them up. Well, they're not all going to make enough money for you to do that. that. That's a crazy idea. And then four years after Iron Man is released, we get the Avengers. And I remember sitting in my chair and seeing that scene of the Battle of New York where it's one shot. Of course, it's all stitched together with VFX, but you're swooping through and you see each individual member of the Avengers fighting in the Battle of New York. You go to Thor, you go to Captain America, you go to the Hulk, you go to Iron Man. And this was superhero filmmaking on a scale that I'd never seen, that nobody had ever really seen, that we all take for granted now. I mean, it was one-tenth the size of that big spread scene in Avengers Endgame. At the same time, I cannot deny the impact that this movie had on me, even if it has been surpassed by other movies, and it's my pick for 2012. You've managed to piss off every single one of them. That was the plan. Not a great plan. I have an army. We have a Hulk. My pick for 2013 is another movie that I think has really aged well, and it hit me at a very specific moment in my life that I'll never forget, and that is Spike Jonze's Her, starring Joaquin Phoenix. I think it has a lot to say about our connection between technology and our disconnection from humanity, but it's also this twisted, yes, but also in many ways sweet love story, and there's such a a sadness and a tenderness to the dissolution of this relationship. I've never loved anyone the way I love you. Me too. Now we know how. I think that Joaquin Phoenix is one of the best actors working today, definitely one of the most versatile, and I think that her is a great snapshot now, a decade later, at a society, our own society, that was on the verge of an even more interconnected reality with technology. I'm not tethered to time and space in a way that I would be if I was stuck in a body that's inevitably gonna die. Yikes. 2014 was another year where I had to pick two movies. The first one is Boyhood by Richard Linklater, the cinematic experiment that became a meme, mostly thanks to Red Letter Media, and I respect their take on it. But did you know that it took 12 years to make? Nothing has ever taken 12 years to make. But I don't think it's just a gimmick, and that's the main thing where I would kind of differentiate what a lot of people think about this movie. I think it's actually really effective, and, and it may just be for personal reasons, because the relationship between the lead character in this film and his mother, who is played by Patricia Arquette, reminded me a lot of my relationship with my own mother, and it kind of goes to show you how you relate to movies, especially ones where you see elements of yourself in them, and how important these movies can be when we can relate to them. The other movie that I picked is Whiplash from Damien and Chazelle. I think you could probably categorize this as a horror movie. J.K. Simmons is one of the most horrific characters in any movie ever. It's also one of my favorite film performances of all time. Count again. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Rushing or dragging? Rushing. So you do know the difference. It's one of the best stories ever made about perfectionism and obsession and manipulation. And I just watched it a few months ago. It is as good now as it was the day it was released. Demon. <laughs> You're done. Getting into 2015, it's another movie that is top 10 of all time material and one that pushed the envelope in ways that I didn't know was possible. Mad Max Fury Road, a cinematic experience unlike anything at that time. It is proof that you can still reinvent and remix the cinematic form. And I don't subscribe to this whole thing of the movie doesn't have a story. It's a simple story, but I think it's also a pretty emotionally rich story if you actually look below the surface. But what a surface. The practical stunts, the visual effects that were most 
mostly invisible, which is oftentimes the best use of visual effects. Mad Max Fury Road is like a thrill ride from hell, and it's one that I like to buckle up and take every year or two. Oh, what a day! What a lovely day! 2016 is another year where I picked two movies. One of them is La La Land, which is the movie that I picked as my favorite that year. Another movie from Damien Chazelle. I love musicals. I love modern movie musicals. I know that people talk a lot of garbage about Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling and they can't sing, they can't dance. Well, they can sing and dance better than I can. So I don't really agree with the detractors in this movie and I think it's a gorgeous movie. I love the choreography. I love the music. I think that it deserved all the Oscars that it won. I think it deserved all the Oscars that it briefly won. There's a mistake. Moonlight, you guys won Best Picture. And then the other movie that I think may actually now be my favorite 2016 is Sing Street. It's one of those movies that just distills what it feels like to be young. The insecurity, the fact that there are people with power over you, but they're not always people that should have power over you. The idea of having these big dreams and not letting anything stand in your way and taking all these big risks because you can take these big risks. It's weird when I was preparing this and thinking about, oh, this is what it felt like to be young and realizing that, you know, 20 minutes ago, I was sitting here telling you about what it felt like when I was young to watch these movies, but this is why it's kind of a fun exercise, and you get to track your life and how your perspectives have changed over the years. And Sing Street is just a joyful film that is about the insecurities and the ugliness and the beauty of youth. He will not be a problem. Really? Trust me, no woman can truly love a man who listens to Phil Collins. We're getting close to the end now. My pick for 2017 is Blade Runner 2049. I've never been the biggest fan of Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. It's not that I don't like the movie. It's just not been one that has ever really engaged me on a deep level. Blade Runner 2049 does do that. I think it's a stunning looking film. The design from Denis Villeneuve and cinematographer Roger Deakins. Harrison Ford comes back. He actually gives a crap, which is great. I like Ryan Gosling in the lead role. I think it's an immersive world that does justice in continuing the story and the legacy of Ridley Scott's movie while blazing its own trail. It's an expansion of what's possible using technology and great movies make you feel transported. And that's what I feel when I'm watching Blade Runner 2049. I feel transported. Sometimes to love someone, you gotta be a stranger. If you know me, it's probably no surprise what my pick is for 2018. It's a joke how much I talk about this movie at this point, and it is hereditary. I saw it early at a critic screening, and I could not wait until the movie came out so I could go back, and I literally took a notebook, and I wrote down everything that I'd seen because I wanted to, to go back and find all of the clues and put together the puzzle. It's rare. I, I can't think of another movie that made me that anxious to go back and experience it again. And then Tony Collette. So now I can't accept and I can't forgive because, because nobody admits anything they've done. What else can you say about Tony Collette and Alex Wolf also? Two great performances that anchor this film. It is a horrifying movie, but it is also one that I have watched so many times over and over and over again. I don't know what it is about this movie that I love so much, but God, do I love it. <gasps> 2019 is another movie where I had to pick two. The first one is 1917 by Sam Mendes, a stunning technical achievement. It was my pick for best picture of the year that year. It's not a gimmick movie. I think it's a lesson on how to use style to make you care about a character, but it's also just a stunningly brilliant looking film, especially that huge shot as you're running out of the trenches with the explosions and stuff going off. It's a great balance of character and technical skill, and I think that it's a marriage into a really, really unique movie. I'm not gonna wait until dusk or for fog. I'm not calling back my men only to send them out there again tomorrow, not when we got the bastards on the run. And then the other film, which I hadn't even seen when I did my best of list that year, but may have actually been number one, is Portrait of a Lady on Fire, which is just a heartbreakingly beautiful, but also heartbreaking movie about love and really kind of being born at the wrong time. Maybe being fated to be with somebody, but the circumstances, not of your upbringing or anything else, but literally of the time in which you were born, those circumstances are going to prevent you from being with that person. And the ending of this movie is just an absolute gut punch every time I see it. 2020, I think, will always be known as the COVID year, but I don't think that means we should dismiss the movies that came out. My pick for 2020 is Emerald Fennell's Promising Young Woman. Carrie Mulligan's performance is one of my favorite performances in any movie this decade. Was it reported? 
Yes. Do you know who Nina spoke to? You. It's definitely a current movie, but it doesn't feel like a message movie. It has an ending that is both endlessly satisfying and endlessly frustrating. And I think that it's a movie that is a hallmark of the time in which it was made, but also will transcend that time. You want milk? No, but uh, you can spit in it if you want. I, I deserve that. <laughs> At the end of 2021, I picked the movie Annette as my favorite movie of the year, but the one that I think had the biggest impact on me, and again, when we look at this film DNA, is another Denis Villeneuve film, Dune. I loved the craft of this. I also was not familiar with this world before I went into it, and it kind of reminded me of seeing the first Harry Potter movie or the first Lord of the Rings movie back 20 years ago when they came out. The idea that you're introducing me to this completely alien world, and yet I understand it. I understand the stakes. I understand the characters. I like the characters. It seems so impenetrable from the outside, but the movie's made so well that it brings you inside this world. This is a movie that I feel like you can feel in your bones, and having now seen the David Lynch film and having read the book, my hope is that Dune Part 2 really just carries on the tradition that was established by the first film in the sense that you are following the story faithfully but keeping your own feel because this is actually my favorite version of Dune that I've experienced, just personal aesthetics, etc. And I'm really rooting this year in 2023 for a great conclusion. Here on Caladan, we've ruled by air power and sea power. On Arrakis, we need to cultivate desert power. And this brings us to our 40th film, and it was my favorite movie of last year. It's tough, though, because I had the least perspective on this. If you watched my Best and Worst of 2022, you know that my favorite movie of the year was Tar. It's the movie that I thought about more than anything else. And when you kind of place it inside of my own movie DNA, I think it would probably be from a character level. And the idea that this movie made me rethink how I think about a character, because you're presented the character of Lydia Tar one way, and then the movie challenges you, the viewer, as to your own perception of that character. And I like that I am now in my 40th year of being a movie fan, and there are still movies that are being made that make me rethink the concept of story, the concept of character, and the concept of how I am ingesting something as a viewer. The architect of your soul appears to be social media. You want to dance the mask, you must service the composer. So Tar is my most recent movie, and it is also my last movie. So what do you think? What do you think of all these movies? Does this match up at all with your time? Were you after me? Were you before me? Are you looking at some of these movies going like, how can these be a big deal? Thank you so much for watching this rambling of a 40-year-old man, or at least 40 years old by the time this airs. It's not going to stop anything here on this channel or change anything. I'm hoping for another 40 years of being a movie fan, and I'm hoping that maybe one or two of you will stick around with me. Thank you so much. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.